At the Glebe Mount House debriefing in August 1944, the ATC Second's regimental and battalion commanders concluded that the troops should be trained to assemble more quickly and to send out search parties for the equipment bundles. It is most important, however, that the hours of darkness be used for the seizure of key points and objectives. The enemy reaction becomes increasingly violent with daylight. Further, prompt aggressive action by each individual is imperative immediately upon landing. An individual or small unit that holds up and does nothing is ultimately isolated and destroyed. An airborne unit has the initiative upon landing. It must retain it. This is the essence of successful reorganisation and accomplishment of a mission. Obviously, the commanders were unhappy with some of their troopers. Too many had hunkered down in hedgerows to await the dawn. A few had even gone to sleep. Part Francis Palace of the 506th saw what was perhaps the worst dereliction of duty. He had gathered a squad near Vierville. Hearing all kinds of noise and singing from a distance, he and his men sneaked up on a farmhouse. In it was a mixed group from both American divisions. The paratroopers had found the Calvados barrel in the cellar, and they were drunker than a bunch of hillbillies on a Saturday night wingding. Unbelievable. The 505th historian, Alan Langdon, attempted to explain the actions of these and other men who were not acting aggressively. He wrote, A parachute jump, and in particular a combat jump, was so exhilarating that first-timers were apt to forget the real reason they were there, to kill Germans. The feeling was, we've made the jump, now the Germans should roll over and play dead. In every regiment it seemed to take one combat jump to instil the idea that jumping was only a means of transportation. Another phenomenon noted was the shock of the quick transition from a peaceful situation to a war zone. Because of it, troopers were oft times reluctant to shoot. Poetus Wayne Burns was crouched beside a hedgerow. He heard a noise on the other side. I climbed up and slowly looked over, and as I did, a German on the other side raised up and looked over. In the dark, I could barely see his features. We stood there looking at each other, then slowly each of us went back down. They moved off in opposite directions. Others had similar experiences. Lutlin Tomlinson of the 508th was moving down a hedgerow. He looked across at a low point in the hedge and saw four German soldiers going in the opposite direction. They were kids. I was within five feet of them. The moon had come out, and one of these kids saw me and smiled. I decided that if they would stay out of our way, we would stay out of theirs. Perpeter J. Nieblas of the 508th was crouched beside a hedgerow with a paved road on the other side. His company CO had ordered him not to fire. He heard hobnailed boots on the road, then saw a German patrol marching past. These were young fellows, kids, well, we were too, and their sharp uniforms impressed me. We didn't fire and I thought at the time, God, I don't know if I could fire point-blank at an unsuspecting man. Some of the battalion and company commanders had given their men orders not to shoot at night for fear of revealing their positions. A few went so far as to order the men not to load their rifles or machine guns. They should use grenades or, even better, their knives. The 82nd's commanders agreed at their debriefing that those orders had been a big mistake. Sergeant Dan Furlong of the 508th would not have agreed. He came down alone and sneaked up to a farmhouse. It was full of Germans. He could hear them talking. They must have heard him too, because a soldier came to check out the farmyard. He came around a corner. And I was standing up against the wall. I hit him in the side of the head with my rifle butt and then gave him the bayonet and took off. Furlong was alone the remainder of the night. So were hundreds of others. Dutch. Schultz wandered, trying to move to the sound of firefights but before he could hook up with fellow Americans, the area would become tranquil. The peace would come, and then the noise, the violence. Then the peace. It was almost like taking a walk in the country on a Sunday afternoon, very peaceful. The peace, and then again, violence. Of course it was the commander's job in a debriefing to be critical. At the time, August 1944, they were planning for the next mission, 
which for all they knew could be at night, so they concentrated on the shortcomings and mistakes of the D-Day operation, rather than congratulating themselves on how well they and their men had done. But although the airborne assault had not been a complete success in the sense of accomplishing all assigned missions, the troopers had done enough that night to justify the operation. The overall missions of the three airborne divisions were to disrupt and confuse the Germans, so as to prevent a concentrated counter-attack against the seaborne troops coming in at dawn, and to protect the flanks at Sword and Utah beaches. For the 6th Airborne, that meant destroying the bridges over the Dives River and capturing intact the bridges over the Orne Canal and River, holding the dividing ridge between the Dives and the Orne, and destroying the German battery at Merville. The Merville battery, four guns of undetermined size in four casemates, stood just east of the mouth of the Orne River on flat, open grazing ground. The assumption by Allied planners was that those guns could cover Sword Beach to disrupt and possibly drive back the 3rd Division's landings, so they had made it a priority target. The battery would be attacked by air, land and, if necessary, by naval gunfire. The air attack by 100 Royal Air Force Lancaster bombers would begin at 02 Gro. It was designed more to create foxholes around the battery and to stun the German defenders than to destroy it. Even a lucky direct hit would not be sufficient to penetrate the thick, steel-reinforced concrete. Next would come an attack by land. But just as the casemates were well defended against air bombardment, so were they prepared for a ground attack. There was a wire fence surrounding the area, with a minefield inside, then a barbed wire entanglement, another minefield, an inner belt of barbed wire, finally a trench system for the German infantry reinforced by ten machine gun pits. There were estimated to be 200 German soldiers defending the battery. So formidable were these defences, so critical were the guns, that the British assigned more than 10% of the total airborne strength of the 6th Division to the task. The job went to 29-year-old Letton Cole, T.B. H. Otway, and his 9th Battalion. He planned to execute it by a coup de main operation somewhat similar to Major Howard's at the Orne Canal, but on a much larger scale. Howard had six gliders and 180 men. Otway had 750 men, 60 of them in gliders, the remainder paratroopers. His plan was to assemble his battalion in a wood a couple of kilometres from the battery, move into position, and attack when the gliders crash. Landed inside the defences, right against the walls of the gun emplacements. If successful, he would then fire a very pistol as a signal of success. The job had to be completed by 05.15. If there was no success signal by then, the British warships off sword would commence firing on Merville. So much for plans. In the event, whereas Howard's glider pilots had put him down exactly where he wanted to be, Otway's pilots badly scattered his battalion. They had not hit a cloud bank but like their American counterparts, they were not accustomed to flak, and thus were unable to judge how dangerous it was. They took excessive evasive action to escape what was essentially light flak. As a consequence, the 9th Battalion had a bad drop. Otway came down just outside a German headquarters. He made his way to the assembly point in the wood, where his second-in-command greeted him. Thank God you've come, sir. Why? Otway asked. The drops are bloody chaos. There's hardly anyone here. It was nearly Doe too, eh? Otway had fewer than 100 men with him. He needed to get into place around the battery's defences before the gliders came, but he needed more than one-seventh of his strength to do the job. He fumed and waited. By 0230, a total of 150 men had come in. Between them, they had but one machine gun. They had no mortars anti-tank guns, radios, engineers or mine detectors. The gliders were due in two hours. Otway decided to attack with what he had. At 2.50, the company-sized party set out, hoping to meet outside the battery a small reconnaissance party that had landed earlier with the Pathfinders. On the single-file march to Merville, the main group passed a German anti-aircraft battery shooting at incoming British planes and gliders. It was a tempting target of opportunity, and the men wanted to attack it, but Otway's task was specific and urgent. 
He did not want to reveal his position, and in any event his time was running out. He passed the word back down the file. No shooting. Shortly, the commander of the reconnaissance party met Otway. His report was mixed. He had cut the outer wire fence and crossed the first minefield. The barbed wire was not as bad as had been feared, but he had no tape with him to mark the path he had followed, searching for mines with his fingers. Worse, the RAF bombardment had been a bust. Not a single bomb had hit anywhere near the battery. At 0430, precisely on time, the gliders were overhead, flying in circles, watching for the mortar flares from Otway that were the signal to come on in. Otway watched helplessly. His men had failed to find the bundles carrying the flares. Without the flares, the pilots of the gliders assumed that something had gone wrong. Otway saw one glider skim over the battery, no more than 100 feet off the ground, then turn away to land in a field to the rear. Otway had no choice. He gave the order to attack. It would be a frontal assault from one direction only. He did not have sufficient troops to encircle and attack from all four sides. He told the lead groups to ignore the trenches and go straight on into the casemates. Follow-up groups would take on the Germans in the trenches. Men crept forward to blow gaps in the inner wire. When they did, German riflemen and machine gunners in the trench system began firing. Otway's men dashed forward, ignoring the mines, shouting, shooting. Many fell, but others reached the walls and put fire through the openings. The Germans, who had managed to survive the onslaught, surrendered. In twenty minutes it was over. Otway sent up the very light to signal success. A spotting aircraft saw it and passed the word on to the Navy, fifteen minutes before the shelling was due to begin. Otway's signals officer pulled a pigeon from his jacket and set it free, to take word back to England that the Merville battery had been captured. The Germans had extracted a terrible price. Fully half of Otway's 150-man force had fallen, dead or wounded. The Germans, too, paid a terrible price. Of the 200 defenders, only 22 uninjured men had been taken prisoner. Otway destroyed the guns by dropping gammon grenades down the barrels. It turned out that they were old French 75 millimetres taken out of the Maginot Line, set up for coastal defence against an attack east of the mouth of the Orne. They did not pose a serious threat to Sword Beach. Nevertheless, it was a brilliant feat of arms. The British Airborne had gotten off to a smashing start. Before daylight, they had taken control of the bridges over the Orne Canal and River, and they had taken the Merville Battery, in both cases exactly on schedule. Howard's men had hurled back a sharp local counter-attack led by two old small French tanks. They had been reinforced by paratroopers from the 7th Battalion. Howard's plan at Pegasus Bridge had worked down to the smallest detail. Otway's plan at the Merville Battery was a shambles before he hit the ground. Otway's ability to improvise and inspire, and Howard's calm confidence and brilliant plan, both showed the British Army of World War II at its absolute best. The 6th Airborne Division had many other adventures and successes that night. One of the more spectacular was the odyssey of Mage A.J.C. Rosevere, an engineer with the 8th Battalion. A civil engineer before the war, Rosevere was given the task to blow the bridges over the Deves River at Bores and Troon. For that job, his squad had brought along in equipment bundles a few dozen specially shaped General Wade charges with 30 pounds of explosive in each. Rosevere landed in the wrong drop zone, wandered around a bit, hooked up with lit David Breeze and some of his chaps, and did an inventory. The squad consisted of seven men. They had a folding trolley and a container of General Wade's. They knew where they were and where they wanted to go, to Troan, the larger of the two bridges, eight kilometres to the southeast. Rosevere had commandeered a bicycle. Even better, a medical jeep and trailer brought in by glider had joined up. As Rosevere remembered it, the trailer was packed to the gunwales with bottles of blood and bandages and splints and all sorts of field dressing equipment, instruments. And I told the doctor to, follow me. I thought, maybe in desperation, it would be good to have some transport. Along the way, in Herovillette, we cut down the telephone wires. It seemed a reasonable thing to do. Sergeant Bill Irving went to do the cutting. I had climbed dozens of telephone poles like this in training, he said. 
I got halfway and that was it, my equipment was too heavy. So, in fact, the wires were not cut. The caravan, with the jeep and trailer in the rear, carried on. At a road junction five kilometres from Troan, eight troopers from the 8th Battalion joined them. Rosevere was greatly relieved. He explained his task to them, said his sappers were ready to blow the bridge once it was secured, and concluded, Infantry, lead the way. There were no officers or non-coms in the group. The eight privates looked at each other and shook their heads. The deflated Rosevier regained his composure and made a new plan. He ordered the doctor to unload the trailer. Did he protest? Rosevier was asked in his interview. He didn't have the rights to any feelings, so we loaded all the special charges and detonating equipment into the trailer. Rosevier sent his sappers to move down to the bridge at Bures, giving them half his general wades to blow it. Rosevere insisted on driving the jeep. I like to be in command of things. And the remaining seven men piled on, while an eighth, Sapapichi, climbed onto the trailer. He had a Bren gun and would act as tail gunner. On the front corners of the hood, Sergeant Irving and Sergeant Joe Henderson sat, Sten guns in hand. The men inside the jeep had their weapons at the ready, covering to the flank. The jeep moved out, straining against the overload, struggling to pick up speed. Fortunately, there were no hills to climb, and the route gradually descended toward the river. Rosevere nursed the jeep along, gradually gaining momentum. He turned a corner without slowing, and we went crash-bang into a barbed wire entanglement, Irving recalled. Irving was thrown off the jeep. There was a pile of arms and legs. The axles were entangled by barbed wire. Rosevere expected a German attack and put his men in positions of immediate defence, then held a torch for Irving as he went to work with his wire cutters. With the torch on him, Irving said, I felt just like a pea waiting to be plucked out of the pod. But there were no German troops in the area. The garrison in Troan seemed to be asleep. Irving finished cutting the wire and everyone mounted up for the journey through Troan. They crept into Troan. Rosevere stopped short of a crossroads and ordered Irving to go on ahead to see if all was clear. Nothing was moving. Irving signalled the jeep to come forward, and I turned round to check again, and whistling past me was a German soldier on a bicycle, obviously returning from a night out. The men back in the jeep cut down the German with a burst of fire. That's done it, said Rosevere. He jammed the jeep into gear and drove straight into the main street of Troan, running downhill to the river beyond the village. Almost immediately the Germans had roused themselves and commenced firing. And the further we went, Irving said, the more the fire coming at us, and the faster Rosevere drove the jeep, and the more we fired back and started to take evasive actions. Irving estimated that 18 to 20 Germans were firing at them. He had started off the run, perched on the left front corner of the jeep, blazing away with my Sten gun at anything that moved. When the jeep reached the end of town, I don't know how it happened, but I was lying flat on the bonnet of the jeep. Irving added, we were all so excited that there was no real feeling of being frightened. Toward the end of the street, a German rushed out of a house with an MG-34 and put it down in the middle of the road. He was a second too late. The jeep was nearly on him. But, Rosevere remembered, he was terribly quick. He grabbed the gun and tripod and ducked into a doorway. As soon as the jeep passed, he set up and suddenly, tracers were streaming over our heads. Once again, a second too late. The jeep was now on the final long, gradual slope down to the river. It picked up speed. Rosevere began taking severe zigzags. The machine gunner could not depress his weapon enough to make it effective. The jeep careened. Peachy fell off the trailer. He was injured and captured. And somehow, Irving said, Joe Henderson, who started out on the front of the jeep with me, finished up sitting back on the trailer. So in the process he climbed right over the jeep. Don't ask me how it was done, but he did it. The squad reached the unguarded bridge. Rosevere stopped, unloaded, gave out orders. He set up guards at each end and told the sappers to place the general wades across the centre of the main arch. In a few minutes, everything was in place. 
Irving asked Rosevere if he wanted to light the fuse. No, you light it. I always thought he wanted to say if the damn thing didn't go off it had nothing to do with him, Irving said in recalling the exchange. The bridge went up in a great bang. It had a six-foot gap in the centre. Rosevere drove down river on a dirt road that soon gave out. The party abandoned the jeep to set out on foot for battalion headquarters. They got deeper into a wood. Rosevere called a halt for a rest. After all that excitement, Irving said, we were desperately tired. We literally flopped down and went to sleep. The sun was appearing on the eastern horizon. They woke within the hour and got to HQ without event. There Rosevere learned that the sappers sent to do the bridge at Bures had accomplished their mission. For the Canadian Airborne Battalion, the objective was the downstream bridge over the dives. By 02, Zer St. John Kemp had his squad gathered but did not know where he was. His mission was to provide protection for a team of sappers who were to blow Robe Home Bridge. Of all things, in the dark of the night, Kemp heard a bicycle bell ringing. The rider turned out to be a French girl who had probably been out cutting telephone wires, as was being done all over Normandy, adding to the German communication woes. French-speaking Canadians talked to her. She agreed to lead them to the bridge they wanted. Off they set. But she led them to a German headquarters and demanded that they assault it. Kemp refused. His job was to blow the bridge, not rouse the Germans. Reluctantly, she led on. When they arrived at Robeholm Bridge, Kemp checked and found the bridge was unguarded. He posted sentries at each end and sat to wait for sappers to come up with explosives. The girl was indignant. Are you going to do nothing? she asked. She had taken great risks bringing them here. Are you going to just sit there? Fortunately, the sappers came up, the bridge was blown, and the girl was satisfied. The British Airborne as a whole had cause to be satisfied with its performance that night. It had blown the bridges it had been told to blow, captured intact the bridges it had been told to capture. It had seized some of the key villages and crossroads scattered throughout the peninsula between the Dives and Orne rivers. It had knocked out the Merville Battery. It had accomplished its mission. The left flank at Sword Beach, which was the left flank for the entire invasion, was secured by the 6th Division before daybreak. But the division was behind enemy lines. It was desperately short of heavy weapons of all kinds. Except over the narrow bridges on the Orne waterways, it had no land lines of communication with the rest of the British army. And no one could say how long it would take the commandos to get to Pegasus Bridge. On the right flank, the Americans were not accomplishing their specific missions as well as their British counterparts. For the 101st Airborne, the primary task was to seize the four inland exits at the western ends of the causeways in the inundated area west of Utah, between St. Martin de Varaville and Pouperville. Other missions were to destroy two bridges across the Douve River, the one on the main highway northwest of Carentan, and the other the railway bridge to the west. In addition, the 101st was to seize and hold the La Barquette Lock and establish bridgeheads over the Douve, downstream from the lock. In sum, the 101st's mission was to open the way to the battlefield for the 4th Infantry Division landing at Utah while sealing off the battlefield from the Germans in Carentan. The execution of the mission got off to an agonisingly slow start. It took hours until dawn and after for units to come together in battalion strength and then another week to sort out the 101st men from the 82nd Swart. Colon Robert Cole, commanding the 3rd Battalion, 502nd Pierre, landed near saint mer Église. His objective, the two northern exits from Utah, was 10 kilometres away. It took time to figure out where he was, time to gather in the men. By 04 Ras, he had less than 50 men gathered together. He set off. In a couple of hours of moving around saint mer Église, the group snowballed to 75 men. It made contact with a small German convoy, killed several of the enemy, and took ten prisoners. As dawn came up, Cole was still an hour short of his objective. For Lieutenant Cartledge, dawn brought a welcome respite. He had thought he was on the Douve River when he was actually on the Murderette. By 04, Cole, he had gathered nine men. 
His squad was representative of many such units across the Cotentin. Cartledge had Litwerner Meyer, from intelligence, attached to Division HG as an interpreter, a demolition man, three radio men, one company clerk, two men from his own company. With only three of us trained to fight, Cartledge said, it was imperative we get with a larger group. He set off toward what he thought was the coast. When daylight came, we stopped on a hillside along a dirt road, set out our landmines in a giant circle, and pulled out our deration chocolate bars and canteens and ate breakfast. Maya, Bravo, Fordick and I sat down together and talked it over, deciding which way to go. At that moment, quite a lot of 101st troopers were sitting down, talking it over. Pevert John Fitzgerald had much to talk about, but no one to talk to. Fitzgerald was from the 101st Airborne. At about 04 Erva, he found a captain and a private from the 82nd. They set out in search of others. The gliders were coming in and a German anti-aircraft battery opened fire. With all the noise, we were able to crawl to within 25 yards of the battery, Fitzgerald related. It was firing continuously. The captain whispered a brief plan of attack, then called out, Let's get those stupids. The private from the 82nd opened up with his bar, hitting two Germans on the right of the platform. The captain threw a grenade that exploded directly under the gun. I emptied my M1 clip at the two Germans on the left, Fitzgerald said. In a moment it was over. Perspiration broke out on my forehead, my hands were trembling. It was the first time I had ever fired at a living thing. I noticed the torn condom hanging loosely from the end of my rifle. I had put it there before the jump to keep the barrel dry, then forgot about it. They came on another, larger battery. They attacked it and were repulsed. In the retreat they got separated. So as dawn broke, Fitzgerald was alone, wondering where he was. Captain Gibbons of the 501st PIR put together a mixed group of a dozen men and at 003 Jusos set off. They drove off a couple of Germans from a tiny village, roused the French residents, pointed and gestured at the map, and discovered that they had just liberated Karkaboot. Gibbons knew that Karkaboot was outside the 101st sector. It was an 82nd objective. He decided to move south toward his original objective, the bridges across the Douve. It was a long way off. When we left Karkaboot, Gibbons remembered, dawn was just beginning. He set off with a dozen strangers toward an objective nearly 15 kilometres away, without any equipment for blowing a bridge. Later, Gibbons remarked, This certainly wasn't the way I had thought the invasion would go, nor had we ever rehearsed it in this manner. But he was getting on with his assignment. Throughout the Cotentin, junior officers from both divisions were doing the same. This was the payoff for the extensive briefings. The platoon and company leaders knew their battalion assignments. By Euro 400, many of them had set off to carry out their missions, however far away the target was. Captain Shettle found his objective before dawn, one of the few to do so. After he had blown up the communication link-up north of Carantan, he moved toward the two bridges over the Douve downstream from the lock. He was to establish a bridgehead on the far bank, not blow the bridges, which would be needed later for the hook-up of the far left at Utah and the right flank coming from Omaha. Shettle had about fifteen men with him. They came to a French farmhouse, surrounded it, called out the family, and discovered that the only German in the place was a paymaster carrying the pay for the entire 6th Parachute Regiment. Shettle made him prisoner and confiscated the money. The farmer led the group to the bridges. They were defended by machine-gun positions on the south bank, but volunteers dashed across and drove the enemy off. As dawn broke, however, German machine gunners forced Shettle's advance guard to retreat to the north bank. Just before dawn, Colonel Johnson, CO of the 501st PIR, had been able to take the La Barquette lock and establish a couple of squads on the far side. The 82nd's mission was to seal off the Cotentin from the south by destroying the bridges over the Douve River upstream from its junction with the Mer de Ré, at pont la Bay and Beauzeville by occupying and holding both banks of the Merdere River, then protecting the southwest flank of Zevencourt 
by securing the line of the Douve River. To the north, the critical objective was saint mer Eglise. At 0400, Let Column Ed Kraus, 3rd Battalion, 505th Pyre, had gathered approximately 180 men. He put them on the road for his objective, saint mer Eglise. In the village, the fire was out, the residents had gone back to bed, and so had the German garrison. It was astonishing and inexplicable, but true. When Kraus got to the edge of town without being challenged, he sent one company to move as quietly as possible through town to set up roadblocks, with mines in front. After giving the men a thirty-minute head start, Kraus sent the other company into town to clear it out. A local Frenchman, half-drunk, who had guided the battalion into the town, pointed out the billets of the Germans. Thirty of them surrendered meekly, ten were shot trying to resist. That quickly, a key objective had been taken. Kraus cut the communications cable point. His men held the roads leading into saint mer eglise most importantly the main highway from Caen to Cherbourg. At dawn, a disaster. A glider-landed jeep towing an anti-tank gun came barreling down the road from Chef du Pont. Before any of Krauss's men could stop it, the jeep hit one of the mines, which not only blew the hell out of it and the gun, but also killed the two men in the jeep and destroyed the roadblock. Fortunately, Krauss had already brought in two anti-tank guns. As the sun rose, he was holding the town the Americans had to have. Nowhere else had either American Airborne Division achieved its pre-dawn objectives. Bridges had not been taken or blown, the causeway exits were not secure. Not a single American company was at full strength, only a handful were at half strength. An hour and more after sunrise, Americans were still trying to find one another. It led to the sobering thought that it might have been better to have come in at dawn. A daylight assembly would have been much quicker, so that by 0730 units would have been on the move the same time or earlier than many of them got on the move, in fact. Twenty-two hours after the drop, at the end of D-Day, the 101st had assembled only about 2,500 of the 6,000 men who had dropped. But despite the time lost and relative failure at assembling, the night drop had accomplished a great deal. It had certainly confused the Germans. The junior officers, taking the initiative, had gathered together however many men they could and were setting out for their company objectives. saint mer eglise was secure. But as dawn broke, every commander from company level on up in the American Airborne felt cut off and surrounded, and was deeply worried about his unit's ability to perform its mission. Despite the mixing of personnel, the two divisions were not in contact or communication. This was not a raid. No one was coming to pluck them out. They had to fight to take ground and hold it and link up, but they had only about one-third of their men to fight with. What they most feared was being forced to circle the wagons and fight defensive actions, without radios or any idea where other Americans were, rendered passive by their weakness in numbers, perhaps even overwhelmed. Just before dawn, Colonel Hayter finally got through to General Marx and received his orders, he should attack with his regiment northward out of Carentan and clean out the area between that city and Stemer Eglise. Haiti set out confident he could do just that. He had under his command an overstrength regiment that was, in his opinion, worth two American or British divisions. His paratroopers were tough kids, seventeen and a half years old, average age. They had been six years old when Hitler took power. They had been raised in a Nazi ideology that had been designed to get them ready for precisely this moment. They had an experienced and renowned commanding officer, a professional soldier with a record of audacity. The 6th Parachute Regiment was a quintessential creation of Nazi Germany. The Nazis had brought together the professionalism of the German army with the new Nazi youth. They gave it new equipment they would hurl their best against the best the Americans could put into the field. Let them come, Goebbels had sneered. Now they had come, and they were in scattered pockets, highly vulnerable. As the first of the sun's rays appeared, Hayter and the elite of the Nazi system marched off to take them on. The first significant counter-attack of D-Day was underway. Fittingly, it would pit an American elite force against a German elite force, a trial of systems. 
Later that day, Nibla saw a paratrooper hanging from a tree. Although he was obviously helpless, the Germans had shot him. That made Niblas furious and settled my problem about shooting an unsuspecting enemy. If he wore a German uniform, I'd shoot. M. André Marse, hiding in a garage in the village, wrote in his diary, It is real hell all over with the firing of guns, machine guns and artillery. Around 3 a.m. we risk a peek to see what is going on. The Americans are the only ones in the streets of the town. There are no more Germans. It is an indescribable joy. I was never as happy in all my life.